Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm very happy to get us started. So there may be people joining us um, as we go, but it's a wonderful day to be together. I want to wish a very, very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, thank you so much for coming today to our SDG Innovation Lab 2022. Um, personally, I'm so happy to be here with you today, and I want to thank you for taking the time. There's been a lot of activities this week, International Development Week, and we appreciate that each session you come to does take your time and your energy, and uh, we are glad you're here. So I want to just start by saying that there is closed captioning available, and you can access it at the bottom of your screen by hitting live transcript uh, show subtitle link. So we hope that works for you. My name is Kimberly Gibbons, and I have the pleasure of being the executive director of OCIC, which is a great job to have, um, especially at this time when we're all together and we get so many chances to uh, share and be together. So I'm joining today from the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, the Métis, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. Um, today, the meeting place of Toronto, which comes from the Haudenosaunee word Takaranto, is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to be here. Uh, in all of our work, in all of our events, we are emphasizing that um, we have a very um, firm commitment to safety and inclusion in these spaces, especially this online space. Uh, so we ask all of you to commit to the code of conduct that we've created for these events. Um, you would have received it in your registration um, reminder, and we're also sharing it with you. So this code outlines the shared commitment we have towards respect, inclusion, humility, safety, solidarity, patience, and openness for all of the participants and all of the collaborators. The session today is being recorded and will be shared with you later in the day. Um, so those are the technical things that I want to say. Um, now to start to say this is the ninth of 10 events that OCIC as the council is hosting um, over International Development Week. And this is just amongst the many, many events and initiatives that have been offered by all kinds of civil society groups, OCIC members, our colleagues, our partners, the Government of Canada, all, all across Canada and around the world. Um, and the intent this year, I really felt it, that it's really been to shine a light on a range of very important issues, uh, leaders of all ages, of all kinds, from all spaces, and many different approaches to significant issues affecting the global community, and to looking in particular at the pursuit of equity equality, inclusivity, decolonization, and universal sustainable development. Uh, we have a very special program today, and I want to begin by welcome, welcoming our very close friend and colleague, Shaili Wabi-Jijik, um, to share an opening prayer and remarks. So Shailene is Algonquin from Timiskaming First Nation, Caribou Clan, and is also Irish and German. She grew up in Rama First Nation and is passionate about learning more of her Anishinaabe culture and language. She is also currently the Program and Outreach Coordinator for the Kawartha World Issues Centre in Peterborough and graduated from Trent University uh, in Indigenous Studies and Philosophy. So Shailene, over to you. Thank you very much, Shumi Gwetch Kim, for the introduction. Ani Bojo, hello and welcome everyone. Um, I will begin by introducing myself in the language that was given to my people, Anishinaabe Moen. Ani Bojo, Shailen Wabakishik, and Dishnakas, Nuno Dewezewin, Timisk Ming Donjaba, Atik and Dodem, Minwa German, Irish, Minjikining and Donjaba, Minwa Nogojiwanang and Dida. So, Miigwech, thank you so much for having me here. I'm honored to open this space in a good way for day one of OCIC's virtual SDG Innovation Lab on Dignified Storytelling. I will begin with a prayer of gratitude that was given, uh, written by Isidore Toulouse called the Ojibwe Morning Prayer. Miigwech Gruja Minado, thank you, creator. Kinkina Gego Gajitoyen, for all that you have created. Miigwech Nimishomis thank you, grandfather son. 
for shining on us today. Miigwech nokumis de Jesus. Thank you, Grandmother Moon. Gebe wasayajien ne dipikag for shining on us at night. Miigwech gokmekwe gimishiang. Thank you to Mother Earth for giving us bimadzuen, life. Gimishiang mijim, food. Gimishiang mishkiki for giving us medicine. Gimishiang nibish for giving us water. Gimishiang wesinyag for giving us the animals. Minwa gimishiag nesiwin and for giving us breath. Big thank you to the creator. I also want to acknowledge our ancestors who are always with us. Miigwech for your life and legacy. I acknowledge all future generations that will come after us. Miigwech for your potential and for allowing us to borrow this place from you until it is returned to you one day. To all of these things and to all of you, I honor you, I respect you, and I love you. May we keep all of these thoughts of gratitude in our hearts and minds and keep them clear as we do this important work together. The theme this year is dignified storytelling. To me, this is about people telling their own stories and are met with honor and respect. As we know, it matters whose stories and which stories are told because stories are, and truth telling hold power. The story told of indigenous peoples in so-called Canada has been and continues to be very dark since colonization. But the story of colonization does not define us, nor do the stories others tell about us define us. We are defined by the stories of our own people, the ancient stories of our ancestors. For indigenous peoples, stories are tools because the answers must be sought out within the story and interpreted to find the lesson. Our oral traditions are an integral part of who we are as peoples. Our beautiful creation stories, our kinship systems, our institutions, all center storytelling, whether it's from our elders and knowledge keepers, our dancers, artists, and singers. I enjoy learning the stories of my people and the stories from others around the world. Miigwech to OCIC for their continued hard work and putting such an important focus on this year's SDG Innovation Lab. We cannot achieve any of the SDGs, global social justice, human dignity and participation for all without space for telling the truth and our own stories with bravery and dignity. OCIC is located in what is known as Ontario. Ontario acquired its name from the Iroquois word Canandario, which translates into sparkling water. This is the unceded treaty and stolen territory of many indigenous nations, specifically the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, Métis, and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations. I wish you all a great experience and at this event over the next couple of days, and I hope that these stories will allow us to walk forward in a good way together. Thank you very much, all my relations. Shaman, thank you so much. Every time I hear you speak, I'm so touched. Um, I feel emotional listening to you again each time. And it, you bring so much truth and so much meaning. And um, I think that this really helps us to start this event in a good way. Uh, so thank you again for always uh, being willing to work with us and to share your views and to just share your beautiful, beautiful words with us. So maybe we can all hold it for a moment. And now I just want to introduce our next guest. Uh, this is a real pleasure to have so many special guests coming to us today. So um, now I'd like to introduce Stéphane Levesque, who is Assistant Deputy Minister Public Affairs from Global Affairs Canada. Um, ADM Levesque has provided communications, advice and support to ministers and deputy ministers on a number of high level and high priority uh, topics and has taken many high profile leadership roles in support of modernizing the federal government communications and community. There are a number of details about his background that's on his bio, so I'm going to direct you all to read his bio and we'll take the time now to have him share his words to us. So we're very honored to have you join us. Uh, if you'd like to go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to the uh, OCIC for or organizing the event. 
um, it's a real pleasure for me to help you kick off today's innovation lab about dignified uh, storytelling. It's something I hold dear to my heart. I'd like to begin, however, by acknowledging that I am joining you today from Ottawa, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Nation. By recognizing the history of Canada and the people who live here, we are prioritizing honesty and making space for complexity in how we talk about people, about Canada and its ro role in the world. Storytelling that is dignified, compelling and respectful is important to me as a communications professional at Global Affairs Canada. And I'm sure that it's the same for all of us who work in international development. The principles of respectful and ethical storytelling are not new. We have focused on this theme over the past few years as part of our renewed commitment to diversity, inclusion, equity, and anti-racism. Our communications about international development, everything from speeches to videos to social media are all considered through an ethical storytelling lens. At Global Affairs Canada, we developed an ethical storytelling guide a unique internal guide to help find consistency in telling stories in respectful and dignified way while demonstrating our commitment to anti-racism, diversity, inclusion, and equity. Our ethical story storytelling guide is intended to help anyone make good decisions about the language we use and the imagery we make, as well as the stories that we share. It focuses on the importance of sharing the voices of images of people with lived experience while being mindful of common stereotypes and instead provoke thoughtfulness, care and compassion when depicting people in vulnerable situations. This is an important step for us because it created an environment where we can discuss these issues more freely. We can ask uncomfortable questions, and in doing so, we can grow as creative professionals and communicators. Our focus on ethical storytelling has started conversations about how we can better amplify the voices of people most affected by an issue. It's made us more careful about how we frame Canada as a partner and not just as an international donor. And it's motivated us to reflect on how words and imagery can feed into biases and stereotypes about poverty, about different regions of the world, about different races and ethnicities, and about different gender. Telling stories with respect, dignity, and compassion is the right thing to do, but that doesn't mean it's always easy. My colleagues and I are learning and we recognize we don't have all the answers, that's for sure. Finding the right tone, appropriate words, and meaningful examples that will connect with our audiences is not always an obvious task for us. One of the most challenging aspects of dignified storytelling, at least for us, and I expect for some of you, is speed. In digital communications, in the communications world that we live in, social media sets the standard for snappy and very up-to-the-minute content. But the reality is dignified storytelling often demands that we take our time to look at issues from different angles and with substance, to seek out people with lived experience, to make new contacts, and to avoid relying on lots of oversimplified success stories in favor of stories that are more nuanced and complex. We apply this guide pretty consistently. At a recent example, um, a recent example that I can bring to you is when Canada co-hosted an international pledging conference in solidarity, solidarity with Venezuelan refugees and migrants. Leading up to the conference, we built a digital storytelling campaign to connect the lived experiences of Venezuelan refugees and migrants with Canadians through videos, imagery, and articles. We created a Spotify playlist of regional music and testimonials and issued a call to action for Canadians to walk in solidarity mm -hmm. with the millions of refugees and migrants who fled Venezuela. And at the end of the day, we were able to host an international event that not only raised funds for the cause, but also felt dignified and respectful of the people we aim to support. Dignified storytelling is such a rich topic, and we have so much to learn from one another's experiences and best practices. 
I wish you all a great morning, and I hope you'll keep finding opportunities to exchange about how to tell stories that are captivating, respectful, and dignified. Again, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup et passe une très belle journée. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. That's, um, it's really very interesting to hear this um, extra level of detail and to understand the context and to hear those examples. I, I know that for OCIC, we have three strategic directions and the second of them is multi-stakeholder dialogue. Um, and I think that sometimes, you know, we're all in our own silos and we have our own approach to how we do that work. And it is actually when we connect all these dots and understand better that there are multiple different ways of going on this journey. Um, and it's good to hear that we have a shared commitment towards ethical, dignified practice in, in different ways, but that it works. Um, all of us are storytellers in some way. Um, so the more we're aligning on that path of working in solidarity, in partnership, uh, and with trust with communities that's um, setting us forward in a, in a better way than we have. So, so thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. We appreciate your time. We know you're very busy. Um, and uh, so I hope you have a wonderful day as well. And we will share the video with you later and be in touch. Um, now it's a great pleasure to pass on the mic to our wonderful communications and content specialist, Eliana. Thank you, Kim. Thanks so much. I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote performance and Chief Moomin. Chief Moomin is a Ghanaian performance poet, playwright, and creator of theatrical spectacles. He shook the stage during his performance at the Dignified Storytelling Forum at Expo 2020 Dubai in December 2021. We are so honored to have him join OCIC as our keynote performer during International Development Week 2022. He has over 15 years of experience in the performing arts. He has been featured on various stages in Ghana, Singapore, Nairobi, Dubai, Lagos, Germany, and London. Chief Moomin believes in the power of the arts to heal, inspire, and transform people and nations. His works often draw from history and heritage to highlight the interconnectedness of the human experience. In 2017, he was awarded as one of Coca-Cola Ghana's big six young achievers in the category media and entertainment. We are now going to share Chief Moomin's performance on the 10 principles of dignified storytelling that took place at Expo 2020. Although the end of the performance includes specific references to the expo, we will play it fully from start to finish and hope you enjoy it as much as we did. Elizabeth, can I please ask you to share your screen so that we can share the performance? Across the sunlit savannah, Sahel, and Sahara of West Africa is an ancient guild of storytellers whose practice dates back thousands of years, known by different names to different peoples in different places of the region, Jenny in Mandi, Arukin in Yoruba, Jesere in Soninke, Lunsi in Dagbani, all together known as the Griot in Western Palace. Once upon a time, these storytellers occupied a pride of place in the great empires of West Africa. They were the memory of the people, repository of knowledge, customs, and traditions, their tongue, a bridge between the past, present, and future. You would not find a more honored tradition of storytelling anywhere else. When they stood to tell or sing their stories, they would introduce themselves and their lineage, and then they would proceed to say the following words in a variety of ways. This story I'm about to tell you, I have heard from my father, who heard it from his father, who heard it from his father. You may meet another Greek with a different version of the story because that is how he too had it from his father. This 
sort of disclaimer always at the beginning of the stories of these consummate storyteller speaks directly to a foundational principle of dignified storytelling it is not my story the understanding that as a storyteller your fidelity is to your characters and contributors whose voices you must project whose stories you must respect whose agency you must uphold whose dignity you must preserve by centering your contributors and allowing their humanity to flourish you are on course to uphold the second principle i do no harm that your stories must not incite inflame or cause harm to your contributors and their communities it must not cause harm to their contributors because you must prioritize their safety and well-being when the grill admit that there are several versions to their stories, they are acknowledging nuance, acknowledging complexity, because there isn't just one story to a people, there are several stories. A narrative must be understood within a full context. They are acknowledging that we are all multi-dimensional. And because the stories of people are diverse and complex, why they are told, how they are told, where they are told matters to those whose stories are being told. And they must be fully informed to approve of what is being told because consent is more than paperwork. It is not just a signature on a page. It is active engagement at every stage. Again, when the West African storytellers introduce their lineage and tell you that they are stories from their forebears, they are acknowledging bias, acknowledging complexity because stories are often filtered through the lens of the teller. As a storyteller, you must acknowledge that I am biased and must not seek to control the reality but to allow the truth of your characters and contributors to flow. For the truth to flow, you must first understand what that truth is. You must immerse yourself in the cultural and historical context of the story. Your audience must understand the background that informs the experiences of your characters. Your audience must understand the background that informs the experiences of your characters because, because, because in this world, the one thing you have to acknowledge is that storytelling is much an art as it is a science. The science of storytelling is research. I do my homework. Another great and time-honored tradition of storytellers we can draw inspiration from comes from the diverse indigenous peoples of Native America, from the Cherokee to the Apache to the all the Native American people. This great culture in their stories demonstrate a remarkable nexus between humans, land, and mother nature. There is a soul in every plant, animal, and even the rivers and the land. A great chieftain once said, this land does not belong to man. Man belongs to the land. We are not the center of the universe, merely a strand in a grand tapestry. The stories of these diverse indigenous peoples of America seek to cultivate a great sense of respect, humility, and empathy for all things. As a storyteller, you are not the center of the story. You must care about the people and places whose stories you are telling. You must ask yourself if this was my story. Is this how I want it to be told? You must uphold the principle, I am empathetic, and thoughtfully reflect on the impact of your stories on people, communities, and the environment so you can mitigate the negatives and elevate the positives. Once you truly empathize with your characters and contributors, you would uphold the principle, I protect other people's data like my own and prioritize truth over headlines, especially so in this fast page digital age where stories are keen to and their click swift to go viral in TikTok seconds. Accuracy and authenticity is key when telling a dignified story. What is the one thing that has propelled the world to evolve from the ordinary to the extraordinary? To move through the caves in time. What is that thing that makes us 
honor our dreams. What is the wind that swells the sails to push us on the great seas of life? What do we live for that defines the very essence of our humanity? Stories. Stories open up our minds to the endless possibilities of this world. Stories are the lessons of the past, experiences of the present, and visions of the future, like the story of how a Sheikh Zaid lived for his dreams to forge a proud nation out of the dispersing Bedouins defying the harshness of the desert. Today, the Emirates stands as a strong union of shimmering progress from the deep black wells of Adi Dhabi to the mountain peaks of Ras Al Haima into the sunlit beaches of Fujairah from the pearly shores of the Bay Ajman and Sharjah into the mongoose of Umm Al Quwain this is a wonder of the modern world and it is in this wonder that the world has immersed itself in the greatest show of our time where dreams would take flight and soar into the realms of reality where minds and heart would connect and human ingenuity would catalyze new dimensions in art and science. It is here at Expo 2020 with Dubai Cares that we gather today to usher in a new age of storytelling for the times where we put human dignity at the heart of our stories by pledging to uphold the 10 principles of dignified storytelling. Stories are powerful. A story can change the world, and we want to change the world for the better. One dignified story after another. Wow, I I watched this once when it first inspired me, and then I watched it a couple more times to prepare for this session. But even watching it now, it still gives me goosebumps. And there's something about the music and Chief Moomin, the way you spoke, and even how the icons were sewn into the cloak. It's just so powerful and so beautiful. And thank you for bringing the dignified principles of storytelling in such an artistic way that, that honestly doesn't leave people because you move them emotionally. So I'm very grateful, we're very grateful that Chief Moomin is actually with us today to share his reflections, thoughts, and experiences on dignified storytelling and the 10 principles. Without further ado, please help me welcome Chief Moomin to the virtual stage. Welcome Chief Moomin. Hello to everybody joining us in Canada and around the world. Hello to my friend Raju joining us from the expo. Um, I'm really very excited to be here. This is actually my second time of um, watching that video. Usually after performances, I just kind of like pack everything. I don't want to go back to it. And uh, I was just wondering how was, I was able to get through that, but I'm glad that it went very well. I um, thank the OCIC for inviting me. Uh, this is one of the major events I've joined around Dignified Storytelling after the Expo. And I'm excited that these uh, principles are inspiring young people across Canada, you know, bringing this initiative to the fore. And I just want to briefly share a few perspectives, you know, that informed even what I wrote, you know. Um, I think that for me, fundamentally, dignified storytelling comes down to just one thing. It comes down to how you see the world, right? If you see the world through the lens of dignity and respect, then chances are that you are going to treat people and their stories with dignity and respect. And how you see the world also depends largely on how you understand the world. You know, the way you understand the world informs the way you see the world and informs the way you treat yourself and people in the world. And to just share a personal experience, when I was young, I used to spend a lot of time back in school, in primary school, in the library, not because I was particularly studious, but because I had a fascination for encyclopedias. I, I'd, I'd like to just go and set up where the encyclopedia was and I'll just take from A to Z and just read about people and places and cultures. So at a very young age, I had quite a very complex nuance and extensive understanding of people and places. And one of the things that I came to conclusion at a very early age is that I'm really not special you know, in, 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 in any extraordinary sense. I am just, you know, one, you know, in, 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 in a world with billions of people and species and all of that in a, in a planet, you know, with millions of planets in a galaxy with millions of galaxies. So that when you begin to see how, if you like insignificant you are, but significant in a way in the scheme of things, then you, you it grounds you in a particular way and it gives you an internal humility that enables you to approach the world 
within that viewpoint, you know. For example, if, and this is an extreme example, right? If you were a Hitler, you would see, you know, the, 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 your world through the lens of superiority. You understand that you belong to a superior race and therefore everyone other, every other person in the world is beholden to you and only you deserve to occupy this earth and, it's, and enjoy it to its maximum, right? That's, that's the extreme example. So just by appreciating the complexity and diversity of this world at a very tender age, it gave me this grounding in the way I approached the world, the way I, the way I, I saw things. And since then, as I became an artist, I've re realized that every time I have to write something, you know, I would usually be inspired by history and heritage. That's why in my introduction, it was said that I... I am interested in the interconnectedness of the human experience because really, when you look at it, we are all connected in one way or the other. So I approach my work through that lens of understanding that the world is complex, is diverse, is unique. And the best way to appreciate that world is to appreciate that complexity and that diversity. And that can give you an inner humility that would enable you to treat people and places with the dignity that they deserve. So. That has just been the way I've lived my life all this while, the way I interact with people back at home, the way I interact with people when I meet them on an international platform, the way I treat issues when they come up, regardless of my, how do you call it, prejudice, which you always try to unlearn, whether it is issues of racism, of sexism, you know, of patriarchy, of homophobia. It is this fundamental core within me to appreciate the diversity of our humanity that, you know, gives me that, you know, humility to be able to engage my world with a sense of dignity and respect. So when Raji got back to me and introduced this beautiful concept of dignified storytelling that he and his team was working on, I just felt so much at home with a lot of the principles and I could identify with some of them, especially in the way I have lived my world, my life, and the way I have told my stories, you know, as an artist. And it was just, you know, an absolute pleasure, you know, thinking. So it wasn't very difficult really coming up with a concept because I had a formula that I use, use I, I explore history and heritage. So I asked myself, based on where I come from and how my people have told stories in the past. And, you know, just like, you know, the indigenous peoples of Canada and America, the oral tradition is very strong in Africa, in West Africa, actually. There was a time where some of the most respected people in the world or in that part of the world were the storytellers, the Giryo. So I decided to go back and see how they told their stories in the past. And I could already see some nexus between the principles of dignified storytelling. So that's how I decided to frame the poem that I performed and I'm glad it, it went well. So if there's anything I just want to leave with everyone today, I just want to encourage us to really look at our world through the lens of dignity and respect. If that becomes a part of us, then it is very possible that the way we treat people and their stories, you know, would, would, would also come with dignity and respect and understand that really we are special, but we are really not that special. And we are just one out of billions, you know, and thousands of years, millions of years of history. And that we should just brighten our little corner, make a change in the world and leave a legacy, you know, for the continuation and the betterment of the human race. So thank you, OCIC, for inviting to me and I'm very excited to share my little thoughts with all of you today. Thank you so much for sharing those remarks. Um, I really I really resonate with a lot of what you said. You talked about grounding, you talked about humility, and I hope that these are carried through into our discussion today. And it's a great place actually to introduce our session and discussion for today. So I'm gonna pass on the virtual mic to Rakaya. Rakaya is our SVG Innovation Lab Coordinator and she will be moderating the panel for today's session. Rakaya, over to you. Thank you so much, Ileana. Um, and I think you honestly said it the best. Uh, regardless the number of times I've watched Chief Moomin's performance, um, I'm completely moved every single time. Um, and what a powerful reflection, Chief Moomin, about um, maintaining humility as we go about in the world. Um, and that we are all inherently storytellers, full of rich experiences, unique to who we are, um, and that we are all stories. And again, it is stories that do change the world. Um, so my name is Rakaya Haseem, and I would first like to acknowledge that I am joining from the traditional unceded land of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation, also known along settler lines as Ontario, Canada. I acknowledge that there have always been Indigenous people in the spaces we call home, so it is expected that we move forward with kindness and respect. 
So this theme of storytelling is something that I am very passionate about, and by no means am I a qualified journalist or filmmaker, but I do consider myself an aspiring storyteller who is eager to learn more about how I can share stories in a dignified and ethical way um, in my work in this international cooperation sector, um, but also in my life. So I would like us to start off by set setting intention. Um, what brings you here today? What are you interested in learning? What forms of storytelling do you enjoy? And in what capacity are you already telling stories? To help us reflect, I kindly invite you all to complete the following poll of three questions uh, that should pop up on your screen momentarily. Um, and I will give everyone a few minutes to answer. Wow, it seems that we have a really diverse crowd with us here today. So many different types of storytellers, so many mediums, so many backgrounds. Um, and I invite you all to um, keep in mind your answers as we dive delve into the discussion with our panelists. Today's panel will help us to understand what it means to tell stories with dignity as individuals and as civil society organizations, and how we can work to bridge theory with action. With that being said, it is a privilege and honor for me to be among today's guests who are expert storytellers in their own right. Without further ado, I'd like to begin by inviting our panelists to briefly introduce themselves. First, I'd like to invite Ragi Saro, Head of International Organizations at Expo 2020 Dubai and lead on dignified storytelling. Ragi, please tell us a little bit about yourself and your story. Thanks, Rukia, and hi, everyone. Uh, good evening from Dubai. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you very much to uh, OCIC for inviting me. It's really a pleasure and honor to be here and to uh, talk about dignified storytelling. Uh, I am, as you said, also an inspiring storyteller. I love stories ever since I was a child. And um, this, this initiative, which was kind of born from like a very small idea with 
with a colleague of mine uh, now is kind of become more of like a passion project. So, so this is where um, it is. My, my story is really simple. I worked in development and I've always felt like there is a need for me to, to jump into the creative industry. Um, I've always had that want and need. Um, and um, as, as we've kind of, kind of progressed in my career, um, I felt that there is a need because uh, there is a big gap between the creative industry and the policy makers, which I've kind of spent most of my career in and my experience has been. So um, this is kind of what my story is at the moment. Uh, I'm trying to, um, you know, create a platform for storytellers um, alongside everyone. Um, and I'm very pleased and happy to be here. Over to you. Thank you so much, Raghi. Um, and I completely agree. I think it's our passion that drives us in everything that we do. Um, and we look forward to learning more about your work around dignified storytelling. Um, I'd like to pass it now to Kath Clark, Communications Co-Director at Interpares. Kath, what is your story? Uh, hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm beaming in today from unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory, also known as Ottawa. Um, as you said, I'm the communications co-director at Interpares, a role I'm pretty new in. Um, and uh, we work with counterpart organizations around the world to advance social justice. Um, I have about eight years of experience in nonprofit communications, specifically in international cooperation sector. And before that, I was a trained journalist. So storytelling um, or um, helping folks relay their stories to other people has really been a big part of my professional life for about a decade. Um, so thanks OCIC for having me. I'm looking forward to chatting. Thank you, Kath. Um, and we are also equally excited to hear about your experiences in this field of storytelling. Next, I'd like to introduce Tina Sweeney, Senior Officer of Outreach and Partnerships at CUSO International. Tina, what is your story? Uh, so thanks for having me, and I hope my eyes are dry because um, Chief Moomin's performance really, uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, helped me to reflect on the privilege that I have in my role. So for those of you who uh, may not know, I work for CUSO International and a little bit about the organization. It's a Canadian non-for-profit organization focused on ending poverty and inequality. And we do that through um, skilled volunteers. So alongside with our staff, we work with local partners. So talking about the SDGs and our story and how to uh, incorporate the SDGs, partnership is really um, the model of the approach that we work with. And then number one, which is ending poverty is the work that we do. Um, and so, yeah, the focus is around um, women and girls and improving economic opportunities. But my personal reflections and my story, so like you, uh, Rakea, I'm not a professional writer or journalist or anything like that, but I work in the public engagement and outreach space. So my story is really curating and opportunities for others to get their stories told and to amplify that. And my kind of remit um, with my work is engaging Canadians. So it's how do we get those stories across Canada from coast to coast to coast uh, and, and in a way that is dignified? So that's a little bit about Kuso and myself and my role within this whole discussion of dignified storytelling. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Um, personally, I've been following CUSO International's work for a very long time, so I am definitely excited to hear more. Um, and last but not least, I would like to invite Tristan Schneider, Indigenous Youth Facilitator, Advocate, and Entrepreneur. Tristan, what is your story? Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm calling in from uh, Toronto, Ontario, also known as the traditional unceded territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, as well as the uh, here on Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Anishinaabe Nations. And what a privilege it is just to share space with you all. And, you know, as I've just been reflecting on everybody's, you know, shared thoughts, um, the one thing that really resonates for myself, I always pay tribute to 
how I got started uh, within my work and in, in doing community work today is really coming from uh, getting involved with my community as being a youth representative. And from there, over the last 10 years, I've been quite uh, immersed within my community. And so I really focus it on being vulnerable um, when I speak um, and making sure that I am uh, that I'm relatable um, when I am working with whether it's Indigenous youth or um, just the community that I do work with. And one of the key things that I really uh, take away from this is the importance of creating space. And that's one thing I notice as I'm currently on my own healing path is the, is the resistance um, within one's journey, but also the importance of being vulnerable and, uh, and making sure that there's um, making sure that there is opportunity for those that don't have those spaces to be welcomed into that space, but keeping in mind that these spaces also not only need to be safe, but they also need to be brave spaces. And so I'll leave it at that and I'll bring it. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Tristan. And personally, from one youth facilitator to another, I am actually excited to hear about more about your work and especially as an Indigenous youth um, and advocate uh, who works in community. And thanks to everyone for sharing. I can't express enough how excited I am to be part of this conversation with you all today, um, including all of you joining online. So now to begin our panel. I'd like to pass the virtual mic back to Ragi to provide some context to this panel discussion by sharing with us what dignified storytelling is, what the 10 principles are, and how they have been developed. Thank you, Rukia. Um, I was just, as I was like thinking now, and I was just um, maybe to set context a bit, I want to reflect on all the different words that has happened during these, like the opening ceremony. And a lot of these terms came onto mind, like inclusion, diversity, dignity, ethical. I kept writing them as, as, as saying respect, accuracy, authenticity, safe, uh, challenging stereotypes and stigma and truth. And, you know, at the beginning, Kimberly you know, talked about the code of conduct. I opened the code of conduct, I looked at it. I was like, no, these are exactly what dignified storytelling is, like in one way or another. And in, it just makes me very proud to see us come to a point where we're going beyond development and aid. And this is where dignified storytelling initially came in. It was the challenge around the development and aid sector where we thought we need to kind of fill the gap. And it's interesting to see when you did the, um, the poll that um, visual storytelling was came in at the beginning, which means that in fact, that this is a big shift and there is a big need for, for more kind of best practices around that. So um, I just wanted to kind of, you know, set the context um, in, in that way. Um, I would love to play um, a video that kind of showcases what dignified storytelling is rather than going into an introduction because it's just a little bit more interactive rather than you hearing me speak. Um, so let me first, sorry, stop this and let me share this video with everyone as an introduction. Storytelling is a powerful communication tool that brings us together and reminds us of our shared humanity. For thousands of years, it has been the main means of passing knowledge, preserving history, and influencing hearts and minds. Stories evoke emotions, connect us across geographies and backgrounds. They make us put ourselves in other people's shoes and help us relate with one another. But in many cases, we have seen storytelling used irresponsibly in ways that undermine reality and downplay the challenges faced. We have seen storytelling fail at producing a deeper understanding of current issues. We have seen it also fail in bringing about positive change. So how do we tell the story of a young student in a wheelchair giving it her best? A refugee family simply trying to live a normal life. A community trying to keep it business as usual in the middle of a life-threatening conflict. 
you tell it with dignity. As storytellers, we should commit to accurately portraying the on-the-ground realities and making sure we are not showing just one side of the story. We must commit to respecting the voices of people and valuing social, moral and cultural norms. Together, we must empower everyone to work towards positive change. In this digitally driven world, where almost everyone is a storyteller, it is important to be informed about how to tell stories with dignity at their heart. This is why Dubai Cares, Expo 2020 Dubai, the UAE Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, with the support of a global alliance of partners and supporters, are working together towards creating an ecosystem that instills dignity and respect in storytelling. Dignified storytelling will unite the voices of content makers, editors, journalists, photographers, filmmakers, contributors, storytellers, and all those working with them to develop and agree on guidance on storytelling practices that upholds the dignity of all people and creates a positive environment. Join us and let us together tell stories with heart, truth and empowerment. So, this is in summary, what, what we are trying to kind of also do, and it's kind of like an introduction to dignified storytelling. Um, I don't know if you can see my screen now. Perfect. So I'm not going to get into kind of the details of what it is, but it's kind of like the gap we saw out there was kind of, you know, we need to, in a way, create a platform. And I'm very happy also this morning, I mean, this, this, uh, at the beginning to hear from um, the representative from Canada talk about that there are already ethical uh, guidelines that are out there. And we knew that there is a lot of best practices out there, but what we're trying to do is kind of how we can connect and how we can combine and consolidate as well those available best practices and create something um, that can enable um, communication managers, contributors, in, in one way, storytellers, but also people working with storytellers, as well as kind of uh, fill in uh, the gap between, uh, you know, different stakeholders. Um, this, this initiative, you know, kickstarted at Expo 2020, which, as you're all aware, is a mega event that's taking place in six months with, you know, only like a month and a half to go. Um, it was kind of, in a way, under the theme of connecting minds, creating the future fit very perfectly because we had 192 countries come here. We had over 10 organizations and partners. So it was kind of like the perfect uh, way to kind of launch such an initiative um, to bring together the world and to kind of uh, agree on a set of principles. Um, the way we've done this is that we've created a multi-stakeholder um, mechanism to allow you know, people from different uh, sectors, um, you know, representatives of youth, uh, women groups, uh, disability, um, you know, uh, indigenous, all kind of different stakeholders to come together and agree on a set of principles. And these principles are in a way um, non-binding, but they are easily adoptable and they're easily be kind of considered. And the more we talk to people, the more we talk to, st uh, to, to stakeholders, the more we realize that there, you know, they mean in one way or another something similar to all of us, but they also are different in the way we put them into practice. So they can mean something differently for a filmmaker than a photographer, than, you know, a development worker. But in one way or another, they're always, you know, very easily uh, recognized and very easily kind of adoptable and um, you know, being able to put them into practice. So looking at them, we have the initial, what kind of the base 
of dignified storytelling, which is, it's not my story. And we talked that about it, from, you know, I heard one of my colleagues, you know, mentioned that at the beginning, and it's very important that we amplify the contributors' voices. And here we, we, we like a dignified storytelling to say contributor. We don't like the term beneficiary. We don't like the term, you know, uh, re recipient of donation we love the word contributor because it kind of it's an in, in, it's more inclusive it allows us to work with our partners uh you know one way or another we're both winning in this situation and we're both supporting each other in this project um i do no harm in in all actions uh, it's 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 an ethic that we take to heart and we continue that throughout the entire storytelling process as well as um, uh, you know, in, the, in our daily work and, and, and routine, uh, we are all multidimensional. Uh, consent is more than paperwork. You know, there is validity for consent. You know, you take a picture today. What does that mean in the future? Um, you know, and, and then there is also I am biased. I do my homework. I am empathetic. I protect others' data like it's my own. And then truth over headlines and a story can change the world. And these are kind of the bedrock of dignified storytelling. Under each one of these, there are a set of indicators and there are a set of guidelines. And um, here I would encourage everyone who's listening in to kind of go online and download this handbook, which is in a way um, the, the tool and the guideline that we have kind of produced to to help storytellers in a way. Um, again, we are not, we're not trying to tell people how to do dignified storytelling. We're just putting out what's out there. And this is how it happened. We actually went out for a call and organizations and individuals contributed to this. So it's more of like an inclusive. And I, you know, there's, there's a short version that looks at the 10 principles. Every time you look at, if you can, you know, start looking, it's like, how do I actually put into practice? It's not my story. How do I, you know, what does that mean? And we have tips under there, um, you know, for example, find ways to pass the microphone to, to contributors. When is a storyteller going to, you know, it could be possibly be I'm a development worker I'm in, in, in another country, it's a foreign country, I'm there as a volunteer, as a photographer. Uh, how do I pass the microphone to make sure that I understand what the contributor is trying to say? Uh, respecting that the voice are not silenced or controlled. And they're in one way or in another, they're all linked to, to, to one another. So this is what we have as a platform. Um, at the current stage, we have um, almost uh, 77 organizations as well as 75 indivi individuals as part of our alliance. Uh, this is a, a network uh, where we um, uh, really look at their expertise to kind of help us shape this initiative. Uh, we keep calling it as a movement because it is. Uh, I personally started calling myself a dignified storytelling. And every time I feel like um, in my work, in my line of work, and previously also working in the development sector, working for the UN, we, we sometimes fall under the trap of making sure that we're not like, doing dignified storytelling. And these guidelines are there to remind us uh, around this. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop here, Rukeya, and then you know we can come back later in the questions. But I just wanted to kind of give a bit of context about the initiative and, and um, its 10 principles. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us, Ragi. Um, and as you mentioned, I think these principles are very helpful, but we also see them in various spheres and in different forms, whether that be our code of conduct or our code of ethics, etc. Um, and it was also neat to hear how, you know, it really started from this small idea and effort to bridge this gap in storytelling um, and maintaining humility to this global movement. Um, and I think that is incredibly inspiring. So thank you for sharing. Now, before jumping into, I guess, the global side of things, I want to bring the conversation back to this place we call home, to Indigenous land and people of Canada, um, but also across communities around the world, uh, acknowledging that Indigenous people have been practicing storytelling for generations. Tristan, from these 10 principles and including any other frameworks that you may use, what stands out to you as something that you know, needs to be highlighted when it comes to building trust and relationships with Indigenous communities. 
Yeah, thank you so much for that question. And, you know, I kind of been thinking, you know, a lot of what that can look like. And, you know, to me, they all really do resonate. But I think for myself, the ones that really, you know, stood out for me is, you know, I am empathetic. And a story can change a world. And I think that's something that, you know, when we look at engaging with, especially with Indigenous communities, especially when we look at um, the world that we, that we are in today, especially given um, the difficult year it has been for a lot of Indigenous communities around uh, reconciliation work. And that's one thing that we have been seeing, you know, really on the forefront within a lot of our uh, not only non-Indigenous organizations, but within our own communities. Now we can start to see that we can now get on this healing path of really, you know, uh, reflecting back, but more so having a greater understanding with our ancestors. And so when I talk about that, I talk about um, the importance of really um, emphasizing, um, you know, the impacts that colonialism has had on Indigenous communities. And so with that, you know, um, when, when I really, you know, when it goes to building trust and building relationships with Indigenous people, you know, it's not just, you know, parachute in, parachute out, you know, type of effect. It's more so we have to build trust at the speed of um, time. So essentially to say that the way I like to frame it is looking at, at it as a cultural framework. So if we are going to be building a birch bark canoe, we've got to understand that we're, we won't be able to do it overnight. And, and so we go back to our oral history and all right, so in order to build those birch bark canoe, we need to go back to the teachings. And so with that, we also need to understand that at certain times of the year, that's when we can co collect those materials to really get us into that place of building that birch bark canoe. So understanding, you know, when we are looking at um, having conversations with Indigenous communities, we have to look at, at it from a cultural perspective. And just knowing that it will be that time in terms of like weaving a basket together, each important weave, you know, is, is going towards the end goal of that journey of what that relationship can and will look like when we are engaging with Indigenous people. And I think, you know, the one thing I really just want to highlight here is really um, looking at how, a, in terms of really looking at how, um, you know, generation to generation over hundreds of years, um, it helped develop an, um, the imagination and creativity within a lot of our young people in terms of, you know, going back to that cultural framework, you know, these things happen in time. And so that's one thing I would really, you know, would like to say just from a youth perspective, you know, and I always reflect back to how I was raised. Um, I was raised in terms of being really close to my grandparents growing up. And so that's one thing that I really uh, resonates with me is the importance of intergenerational um, storytelling and how that is a part of our culture, but just knowing too um, that, you know, this is, um, a part of the journey when working with Indigenous groups, it, it, all stum it all goes back to that generation to generation of oral history that has been passed down. And so I'll leave it at that and pass it back over to you. Thank you, Tristan. Um, and I absolutely hear you. I think what you've shared really reinforces how not only the importance of building those relationships, um, but also having empathy and realizing the time that it takes to build those relationships and being mindful of that. Um, and that's what will essentially be shown through the way we tell those stories. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and speaking about communities, um, I want to ask Tina, you work with CUSO International, a global organization that works with diverse communities of people, um, be it on the grounds, volunteers, etc. For an organization that is so large in scope and reach, in your role as a public engagement officer, um, which of the 10 principles do you identify or resonate with? And are there any other frameworks that you use or have used? So thank you. Um, where do I start? They're all important. <laughs> to, to pick just a few is, is quite a bit of a challenge, but I think um, I'll echo that it's not my story, it's not my story, and I'll invite everybody to join in. It's 
not my story. Um, but seriously, uh, you know, within that context, I think there's also do no harm. And uh, then also what Tristan said is um, a story can change the world. So let's like from my lens, start off with within public engagement work. It's not my story. So within that framework of public engagement within CUSO. So, you know, we're, I, I love the fact that you said we're a large organization where we're probably mid-sized. We're not, we're not a federation. We are a Canadian <laughs> operation. So just to keep that in context of, of scope, um, I conduct several town halls. So in the beginning, our speakers were often staff or, um, you know, staff who had consent and they definitely understood uh, and respected community members as equal partners. Um, but we knew we had to kind of move the needle and do better. So um, we really, you know, had to step back and know that these weren't our stories. And so um, we became from a public engagement lens, more intentional about getting, and I know I've heard the word contributor, I've heard we don't like beneficiaries. Uh, for us at CUSO International, we use community members. So being more intentional, intentional about having community members themselves tell their own stories in their own words. So uh, from, from a public receptivity standpoint, not only was that more powerful, but the public really enjoyed it when we did surveys and polls and that thing such. And then moving on to do no harm. Um, I like the framework and the kind of um, targets and indicators that have aligned with that. But for CUSO, do no harm in in encompasses a whole lot more. It's not only avoiding things like personal information and asking, you know, thinking about the risk that it could pose, changing names and identities, or even not naming community members altogether. For us, uh, do no harm also includes telling the truth, um, checking our own biases, making sure the story is multidimensional. Um, and one of my favorite, favorite, and I'm sure many of you here know her, uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, The Danger of a Single Story. We use that at CUSO International as um, part of our training and our methodology. And I also use it with our public engagement youth advisors. And I invite you to, to, to listen to it if you haven't, if you don't know of, of this particular um, person, um, but all within that context of that talk encompasses the 10 principles in a very beautiful way. And I'll just wrap up by saying, and I, I think you saw how moved I was um, by Chief um, uh, Moomin's performance, but the stories can change the world. And I think when he was talking, when after that performance, it really hit me to say, wow, I, there's a, such a responsibility um, that ensues and there's a power of emp empathy um, that plays into that. So I think I'll stop there and uh, turn the microphone back to you, Rakea. Thank you so much, Tina. Um, and I really like that actually, that this idea of do no harm uh, really does encompass all these other aspects of the principles. Um, and I think as some people shared in the chat as well, like we identify with that principle um, a lot. So now I'm gonna turn it to this concept that if we maintained ethics and integrity in our storytelling practices, um, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. So Kath, given your role, you know, in communications, um, what can you tell us about some of the challenges that may arise when it comes to broadly communicating a story um, to the masses, to the general public, and what have you learned and how um, do you approach this going forward? Yeah, I, uh, so as far as challenges go, um, I think there's there's often a, a tension between wanting to be responsive and wanting to um, ethically tell a story. And I think as ADM Levesque said earlier, dignified storytelling um, requires that we take our time. And so this means resisting the urge to um, rush work out the door because it's like the current flavor of the week on Twitter. Um, so for, for Interparas that that like slow work of storytelling um, involves building the necessary um, building the necessary lead time into a critical path for lots of discussion, lots of back and forthing, lots of um, rounds of editing, um, 
uh, program, the, the, the program folks review, they edit and feedback into articles and they confer with our counterpart organizations. Um, counterparts, the counterpart organizations we work with, um, they always ensure they've obtained informed consent from people in the photos and stories that we use. Um, so that means, you know, um, giving the photographed or quoted person like a full idea of the context in which we'll use their photo. Um, and that, so we would, might ask, you know, can we use this photo in conjunction with a fundraising campaign? Um, would you be comfortable if we named you in the photo? Is it safe for us to do so? Um, do you want to be anonymous? Uh, can we use your image on social media? And, um, you know, even once you've got that consent, you know, the first time uh, and you want to use the photo again, maybe it's a different context this time and you need to, you need the time to go back and be able to uh, ask your counterpart organization to ask the participant if they're comfortable with uh, this new context that you might want to use their photo in. Um, we also, you as much as possible, use photos and videos taken by our counterparts in order to remain faithful to their vision and their words, and ensure that um, they can represent themselves on their own. Um, so, you know, there's that there, there has to be time built in for our counterparts to uh, go about getting um, photos and do interviews, um, and then it just really takes time to write excessively. Uh, uh, to make, um, you know, uh, a story accessible to the audience that you want it to be accessible to uh, is, is, a, is an art in itself. Um, and another, another challenge is, I think there's, there's sometimes a tension between the kind of story we think we need for a successful fundraising um, and uh, ethically, ethically telling the story. Um, so we're, you know, we're, we're very careful about the emotional toll uh, caused by photos we publish. We never sell poverty. Um, and, you know, it all comes down to, um, you know, the information we share reflects the reality of our counterparts and um, reflects the respect that we have for our counterparts. Thank you so much, Path. I think um, based on what you've said, um, some key points was, you know, emphasizing again, the time that it takes to build these relationships when we're working with our partners globally um, and locally, uh, but also asking those important questions and ensuring that it's a long-term relationship when we're asking those questions. Um, and not just, again, like you said, uh, ticking the checkbox off of the paper. Um, and I like that you really, you know, amplify your partners um, capacity in that way and you build their capacity by you know sharing the space with them and um, letting them lead um, in their own capacities as well. Um, so Tina, I want to um, give the floor back to you. Can you share a moment when you felt the importance of maintaining the dignity and integrity of a story or person and whether there were any challenges that came up when doing so and how you might have overcame them? Sure. Um, maybe I can, uh, I just want to mention to Kath that, um, I guess you're on the fundraising side and I really appreciate that lens and that, uh, integration of like the differences of story, like PE might do it this way, a story in comms might do it that way, but from the fundraising angle, um, I, I love that you brought in the challenges there. So interesting topic, but back to, um, a, a time when, when it's been impacted with myself from a public engagement lens is doing a town hall on a very difficult subject of FGM, female genital mutilation. Cuso and our partners are doing work alongside um, local leaders within a region of Benin. And so uh, because we have a finite amount of time in these town halls, we kind of you know, I've heard that time and speed. I think it was um, Global Affairs Canada. Stefan was talking about that earlier. There, 
there's an urgency or, or you just have to get right to the point. So, you know, sometimes you just have to like, you know, we've all been talking about here, step back and reflect and say, are we being multidimensional? Um, is the work that we are doing truly representing the issue? And so what I mean by that is our, our, key element of the story focus, particularly on a region of Benin, where this practice is happening. Um, but why only show Benin? Like anyone from the Canadian populace coming into an international development discussion for the first time without any background on the issue might walk away thinking like, uh, wow, there's, <laughs> that's a problem in Benin. Like why, you know, why stop there? So we really needed to correct that and really needed to go into one of the principles of being multidimensional and take the time. So as we know, there's at least 200 million girls and women alive today living in 30 different countries that have undergone FGM. And so taking the time to build context and build a fuller context of the global issue versus getting right into Benin, not knowing like who your audience and where they're coming in from, I think that for me was a key takeaway and having those discussions with team members who um, might be more senior and are wanting to, you know, get a certain message out again, I come, come back to what Kath was expressing earlier. Um, but reflecting on the principle of do no harm and not wanting to create our own biases, doing our homework and truly being uh, em empathetic and dignified uh, in knowing the power of a story to change the world or to um, impart a stereotype or an impression on, you know, just a certain context. So for me, the, the, what resonated was just taking the time to step back uh, to be more multidimensional. And I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tina. Um, yes, I really like that. It's reinforcing again this idea of it's not my story. We are all multidimensional, um, and also shifting those narratives. You know, to not continuously perpetuate stigma in the sector. Um, so, Tristan, I know you've worked on many projects and initiatives. Can you speak to your work around changing the narrative? So that we can maintain you know, the dignity and respect of people, and in this case, specifically um, indigenous youth and communities? Yeah, no, for sure. And I really appreciate that question. And then, and so for myself, um, I previously um, had the privilege and honor to engage with First Nations youth across Ontario around a life promotion photo voice project. And so we conducted uh, various workshops across the province. And so, one thing I notice when it comes to um, life promotion work, and so for a lot of you that are not quite so familiar with life promotion, um, this is really coming uh, from one of the suicide epidemics that were, has been hitting a lot of the First Nation communities, um, not only here within Ontario, but across Canada. And so one of the key actions that we thought that we do would more so be speaking to, um, okay, how do we amplify storytelling from a youth perspective? but also giving them the platform and the space to be vulnerable within that. And so one of the key things that we taught, that we noticed when we were even talking about suicide and mental health is that, you know, those words within, within themselves, those are like really hard to say for a lot of people that um, haven't had even the opportunity to discuss these things. And so one of the key things that we kind of took from that was, all right, instead of talking about suicide awareness, let's flip the conversation and talk about life promotion. So let's, let's focus more on that empowerment piece and say, okay, what's the problem? Let's do the preventative piece. So, in, so with life promotion, what we really uh, look from it was really essentially going back to the four key uh, words, which is hope, belonging, meaning, and purpose. And so that was something that Indigenous youth really want to um, change the narrative um, to really amplify what needed to be changed here, but more so to create these spaces to really dignify themselves. But also one, one key thing that we did learn um, throughout this work was, was that even though Indigenous youth were creating uh, and sharing their stories on these platforms was that when it came back to looking at the community, uh, that was what we seen was that there wasn't a lot of these safe spaces for Indigenous youth to return back in the community. But more so what we really created from there was really creating a strong network 
where Indigenous youth could reach out and in terms of, you know, an understanding of the network um, and being uh, relatable. And so, um, and part of that, you know, what a lot of Indigenous youth um, that I uh, had the privilege of working with is really um, understanding that, you know, we are all related here. And that was something that we really wanted to hit home with our storytelling project, was that even though we do all carry different stories of whether it's trauma, whether it's struggle, whether it's humor, um, or whether it's, you know, these stories that we carry on from our grandparents, it's really to amplify that, you know, within the Indigenous community, within the broader Indigenous community, we are all related. And that is something that no matter which territory you want, are on, um, is that we have this connectionness. And I think that's the most unique and beautiful thing that really stemmed from this work. But that's what we are beginning to see within a lot of movement in terms of the relationship work um, when working with Indigenous people is about changing the narrative in terms of let's look at what's the gap, what's missing, and, said, and, and change it more so to in, the in, empowerment piece. And so that's one of the key things that I really took away when engaging with young people is, you know, just taking the ability and just listen to them. And that's one key thing, you know, because that's where we're going to get our most powerful messages. But I think the most profound thing that, you know, did sit with me is that even though that I was here creating space, um, was that the ability to uh, making sure people feel comfortable within these spaces was very key. But I think, you know, the but, you know, reflecting back to it, that was where the, where the most growth really came from was a lot of these young people were very uncomfortable within these spaces. And so and that's that was our key learning is that even though that we are being vulnerable within our own storytelling, um, this is really creating um, a much stronger relationship to relationship. And so whenever we finish a workshop, a youth conference, you know, we're coming becoming as strangers, but we're leaving as family. And so I think that's something really powerful when we go look back, okay, and in terms of, you know, going back to those um, questions um, within life promotion and the questions that we get asked is who am I? Where am I going? Where do I come from? And why am I here? And just knowing um, that it's not just uh, global advocacy, but personal advocacy work within their storytelling. And I think that's something that really hit home. Thank you so much, Tristan. I am actually really interested to learn more about this project. Um, and I really like this idea of life promotion and really reframing the way that, you know, and using our language and when we were using our language and the way we refer to things um, to ensure the empowerment of people. Um, and so maybe now I'll pass it off to Ragi. Um, maybe you can speak to how we can use these principles to frame and reframe the way we tell stories. Thanks, Rakhaya. Well, um, the dignified storytelling principles um, in one way, I mean, the handbook is kind of the tool that can, can help kind of frame and, you know, how we tell stories, but it's, it's made for everyone who is a storyteller, right? Or, or in one way work with a storyteller. They're particularly those um, telling stories within development and humanitarian context. But, you know, if you consume, gather, make, facilitate, um, create or tell stories that touches on like issues of global and local import importance, then in one way you'll be able to kind of utilize the principles and handbook, right? So one way, I think, I think one thing that I would like to also highlight is that it's really a proud moment for us at the Dignified Storytelling team to hear storytellers living these principles and, and naturally referring to them in everyday practice. Um, it's, it's exactly what we, we hope to achieve, you know, through, you know, the different tools that we have developed. So the pledge and the handbook. And in one way, we, we're offering storytellers this valuable resource that, you know, can help them promote and employ storytelling practices that are grounded in, in three different things, you know, like deep, deep um, uh, respect, uh, transparency, uh, you know, and, you know, respect for human dignity. And it offers in a one way, a deep dive to address, you know, all aspects of storytelling. Um, 
and that's a, that's a starting point. So, uh, you know, you, we, we're in one way encouraging those involved in the story generation and consumption towards thoughtful reflection. So there are risk assessment tools that are available in the handbook that can help you in the storytelling uh, process. Um, we, you know, have some sort of tips around how to have open and, and honest dialogues. Um, and of course, how to kind of bring in renewed innovation and creativity in these process. So in, in one way or another, um, you know, you, you look at these principles and they have certain indicators and, and tips and be able to kind of take those and put them into practice. And we've seen it now with our partners, like they, they're doing it differently. Like we, we, we saw one entity that, that approached us and said, um, we wanna start talking to the media. Uh, and we want to start, you know, taking these principles um, and training, uh, you know, our media personnel on them. And we together we started saying, okay, how can this, how can that work? And we started framing and creating new content. So it is a new kind of topic, um, even though it's been there for for quite some time under different terminologies. Um, but in a way, we we're, we're trying to put you know, this framework. And there are also case studies that are out there that can help you um, in one way or another take these principles into practice. Uh, highly recommend, for example, uh, you know, to, to check out War Child and look at their kind of Batman video, uh, you know, how kind of the reframes and positive uh, reinforcement around, uh, you know, refugee um, uh, context. Um, so, in, in one way where we, we have these um, valuable resources that are available in the handbook to kind of help you reframe uh, the way you're telling uh, stories. And you can do that through several avenues, of course, you know, visual storytelling being, you know, the easiest one, but also through um, written storytelling as well, which is one kind of area that we're kind of really looking into now. And we're, we're, we're reaching out to kind of stakeholders and partners to kind of help us, uh, you know, uh, shape uh, that. Thank you. Thank you, Ragi. Um, and yeah, I, I like this idea of living the principles and also how so many different organizations are practicing these principles in different ways um, and that we've been doing it for a long time. Um, and a note to the audience also that you can find more about the resources that Ragi is talking about as well as the handbook um, on dignifiedstorytelling.com, uh, but also on OCI's website. Um, and now I will pass it over to Tina. Tina, um, can you tell us a little bit about the Quiet Dignity Initiative, talking about, you know, projects that you've been working on, um, and also how does your work around storytelling help to advance the SDGs? So I'm just loading up my screen so I can share something here. Hopefully you're seeing it. So for us um, at CUSO, when we talk about dignified storytelling, um, we're really speaking about the expression in our imagery. Uh, I think, um, and I won't get too into it because it boils my blood a little bit, but I think we've all seen the horrible images of you know repetitive over and over and over of the stereotypes the the you know that create harm and bias and i think someone said it earlier around like selling poverty um we were very conscientious at CUSO not to be that kind of an organization and so what it means for us around quiet dignity is um, particularly around uh, photography uh, standards. So our photos express an intimacy, harmony, uh, and an insightful attention to detail. We use images that embody a strong focus of personal view of the relevance of the object and metaphors. And so we consider details such as equality, a subject and partnership roles when taking our photos. So this is an example here of what would be uh, within our photography standard guides as quiet dignity. And within that also, I know we've talked about it here as well, there's around permission. And so I won't go through all the aspects of, cause there's uh, 
there's, it's quite an extensive um, docket around permissions, but I'll just give you two examples. So the community member has not been coerced in any way to obtain permission and um, permissions were obtained in their local language are two of those aspects around permission. So, you know, I just give you a, a little snapshot of quiet dignity to say that we have standards and guidelines, but we are working towards a formalized policy at CUSO International, uh, incorporating elements or all, I'm sure, of quiet dignity in our own terminologies. Um, but yeah, just thank you for starting the discussion. I don't think anyone is at what we consider the end mile in this subject matter. And there's been lots of discussion around kind of who gets to tell your narrative and all the aspects of that narrative that are encompassed. So thank you. I'll stop there and turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Tina, for sharing that. Um, it's actually a really inspiring project that you've been working on. And again, reinforcing this idea of how we're reframing these stories um, and whether that's through um, the medium of photography or through any other medium. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Kath. Um, I know that Interpares has worked on an initiative called Stories of Solidarity. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how storytelling can be practiced to amplify the voices of activists in an ethical way? Um, so, so I'll just take it a, a, a small step back and say that, you know, Interparas is a uh, feminist organization. So, and um, being a feminist organization means bringing a power analysis to everything, uh, everything. So from, you know, the way our organization is structured to um, our relationships with counterpart orgs in the South, um, and uh, right down to our communications and fundraising. Um, so we're really mindful of power rela relations um, as they manifest across the board. Uh, but the reality is like you can't flatten all these existing power dynamics. There's, there's you know, often a funder fundee relationship that's there. There's a north south relationship. Um, you can't get around those, but you can acknowledge and you can work through them. Um, and, you know, as, as, um, as Tristan said, like, it, that takes time, um, and, uh, uh, trust building is a, is a process and, um, it takes long-term relationships. So, you know, we've had partnerships that are 20 plus years long and, you know, the, the, the it's still a work in progress trust is always being earned um so uh all this fem feminist analysis also applies to um communications and storytelling and ultimately uh interpares has the power to control how our counterparts and the program participants are represented in our communications um uh but th with this feminist approach um, to storytelling, we do what we can to undermine our power. Um, and so to do this, you know, we're, we strive for ethically and socially responsible fundraising communications. And to do that, we developed external communication strategies based on intersectional feminist analysis. So through that lens, um, we tell stories and we try to pay particular attention uh, to meeting a few different goals. We want to shine light on leadership and social change work of women and other people marginalized by injustice. Uh, we share perspectives um, and ideas that are proposed and informed by um, women and other marginalized folks. Uh, we use gender sensitive and inclusive language we, uh, we use identity descriptions that reflect the person's self-described identities. We do not um, use images that reinforce harmful preconceived notions of gender, racial identities, um, or other marginalized identities. Um, and we, um, we really aim to raise the awareness of inequality and oppression. Uh, and so, and that's the, using the feminist lens, that's, uh, that's how we um, uh, uh, practice uh, 
amplifying the voices of activists in an ethical way. Thank you so much, Kath. Um, and I think it's interesting what you said about understanding and acknowledging those power relations that are present, um, and also the lens and the frameworks that we're using um, in our work. So hearing about activism, um, Tristan, is there anything that resonates with you in terms of um, storytelling and advocacy specifically? Yeah, um, really great question. And this is something that I really, you know, has been really important to me in terms of advocacy work and storytelling. And I think for me, I think it's really, you know, the healing power of storytelling for myself. Um, and I think that really stems from, you know, that really amplifies, you know, truth telling, vulnerability and resilience. And so that's something for myself that I really, really, you know, take to heart. And I think, that's something that, you know, within Indigenous community that, that is really amplified, um, especially when it comes to, you know, the ongoing uh, various social injustice issues that a lot of Indigenous communities that are facing today. And so one of the, one of the, so I, so one thing to really help provide a visual, um, I guess, visual, you know, how strong um, storytelling is, you know, through healing, I would love to share a video uh, with everybody. It's just over three minutes long, but this really just amplifies um, the healing power of storytelling through a Indigenous lens. And so the video that I'm about to share, this was shared at the final uh, report for the National uh, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. And so this video was shared um, in the room with everybody that was present and this video, there is no dry tear in sight. Um, so fair warning, this might be emotional, um, but they received a standing ovation with this video. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I forgot my apologies there. Okay. Hold me. I'm new here. I borrow breath from Creator, return it like cedar smoke, riding the backs of my wishes up through my throat to the place where hope resides and Creator seems to rest. When we walk alone on a road, and forget we are blessed I guess I'm next but there behind night I saw a round building breathe push to the edge of everything but centered on belief snow losing to suns had settler grip and retreat I went inside to wash my face in smoke rinse and repeat a collection of life fires, where he respects her and she respects him, where they grow into gray hairs and become old friends. Authorities of love, speaking truth to teachings, welcomed like a meal at the end of fasting. A sky woman's womb, life nurtured, no more missing, no more murdered. Give birth to seeds, water them with hope, Creator's instructions and love notes. Held hands or shields, hugging with consent. Ancestors or shelters, every pole a prayer spent. Inherit your spirit. You are not alone. The framework, your body, your own heart, the home. Love. Holding it all together. New spirits need old spirits, like wings need each other like birds need to land, like daughters need fathers. Wrap me up on my Tikkanagan, cover me in quilts of consciousness, pray over me when I can't hear you, when light caves to darkness. Graft me into cedars, evergreen and pleasing, immune to winter's whistle and rooted. Tree of peace, roots north, south, west and east, I understand nothing except that I seek peace. 
And if I find it nowhere else, it can live between you and me. Arrest my patience. Obey the speed limit of prayer. I will calculate the distance to the next star right there. It's family. Not the one inside unpurchased picture frames or letters from residential school names, but a piece of just enough of you and me. Yeah, so I wanted to share that with everybody today and really the message from there and going back to storytelling, you know, it is intergenerational. And I think for myself, when I reflect back to my grandparents who are no longer with me today, I think it's really powerful that, you know, storytelling is one of the key, you know, oral history and traditions, and that really amplifies within a lot of Indigenous communities. And it's really going back to, um, not only is it about being vulnerable, but it's a place of learning. And I think that's something that really hits home for myself. And, and just to really end it off here, and then one of the key uh, takeaways from that video was really to embrace love at no matter, you know, any sort of your journey. And I think that's something that needs to be really articulated um, through storytelling. And this is just one of the insights, one of the lenses that I want to share with you of just how powerful, you know, being vulnerable um, within storytelling can be and how it does work into the advocacy as this video was shared around, you know, the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. So I'll leave it at that and I'll pass it back over to you. Thank you so much, Tristan. Um, and I think someone was asking in the chat if, if you'd be able to share that uh, link to that video. Um, it was extremely powerful and I really did, uh, it did evoke many emotions for me of, you know, humility and like you said, love. Um, and I, it also brought me back to this idea of how storytelling is um, very sacred. And it actually used to be a very sacred practice um, among, you know, small groups of people. And it is still a very sacred practice among groups of people, um, especially in Indigenous culture and other cultures across the world. Um, but, you know, with the rapid exchange and movement of information, um, it's now essentially that everyone's a storyteller, um, but the stories we tell are not always done so with um, dignity and in a dignified and ethical way. Um, especially with, you know, social media and communications platforms. Um, so now my question to either Tristan or Kath, um, can you tell us what some steps are to what steps we can take to ensure the dignity of people when it comes to sharing information and stories on social media or through communications, if either of you can speak to that? I'll, I'll, I'll go first and just quickly just have to say, um, I think, you know, um, the one thing that was really, you know, paramount for me in the, my last year, I kind of made the transition from moving from uh, back to Ontario from British Columbia. And one of the profound things that really, you know, left me with such a strong impact is that even though that in my notion that I was a visitor out on the traditional territories, the Sopotnik nation is understanding that no matter where you are on the territory is that we are all related. And so when it comes to, you know, storytelling and really amplifying, you know, these spaces, and especially in how it, the information gets, you know, shared is really understanding and being, you know, accountable and transparent is that, you know, story from territory to territory is so different. And I think, you know, just carrying, you know, that respect and that acknowledgement that, you know, that yes, there might be interrelations or interconnectedness within the story, but just, you know, remembering the fact that, you know, the, the story itself um, carries so much important for that community, for that person or that family. And so I think, you know, just really amplifying, you know, the authenticity of the story where the territory is being shared, but also really making sure that, you um, to really, uh, uh, in terms of, you know, creating that space to have that understanding as well. And so I'll leave it at that. Um, I'll just uh, 
also um, respond um, that uh, I guess my um, my approach to, to storytelling, story relaying um, kind of has three parts. And uh, so number one, the, the feminist framework around it, which I kind of described last uh, last time I spoke, um, you know, having an awareness of of uh, my personal uh, power, the organization's power, um, and um, working uh, working consciously, and also having processes in place to undermine that. Um, uh, the second part is I kind of because of my background, how I like approach things um, journalistically. And um, so, you know, I will, I, um, a few examples of approaching things that journalistically would be uh, attributing um, quotes and naming the people in the photos if it's safe and consented to, um, creating a style guide with sections about inclusive language and common pitfalls um, and how to avoid them. Um, and it, this, you know, a style guide uh, helps you to be really intentional about your language. Uh, so, for example, Interpares has made the decision to refer to the partial military takeover in Burma as an attempted coup um, to honor and acknowledge the fact that activists, indigenous folks, and um, even parts of the bureaucracy are still like actively resisting. Um, so that's an example of how to be, you know, that's an intentional an intentional um, uh, language use and that goes within the style guide. Um, you know, you're also um, accountable to your donors and supporters and, and some of them are, you know, only getting their info on a certain context from your organization. So um, you show them the truth of what's happening and you don't uh, resort to either, you know, selling poverty or representing a falsely positive situation. Um, and, you know, truth is, is always important and it's ever more important um, these days as the, you know, spread of misinformation is more and more abundant. Um, and then uh, the last, like another, the last kind of example of, of a journalistic approach um, is to write excessive, excessively. And I, and, and, um, you know, it doesn't mean simplifying, it just means meeting your reader where they're at and bringing them along. And, um, and to write excessively uh, takes time again. <laughs> um, and then third, the third uh, prong of the approach is relationship building. Um, as I kind of discussed earlier, relationship building is key. Trust building is, is so important and it's always a work in progress. Um, in a world with, you know, stark, stark power dynamics, trust is really hard to build and it's very easy to lose. So long-term partnerships allow space um, to build the, tr the necessary trust. Um, uh, and then a, a, a really kind of like concrete way of, of building trust is to always, you know, there's the process of writing the story, co-creating the story with your counterparts or participants, and then um, following up. Like the story is not, uh, you're still responsible for the story after it's out in the world. So um, send the finished product to your counterparts, make sure the people highlighted get to see um, that, you know, see themselves uh, in whatever media you've produced. Um, yeah, follow up is super important for relationship building. And that's, uh, those are kind of my three prongs for, um, you know, making sure, doing our absolute best to maintain the dignity of people. Thank you so much, both Kath and Tristan. Um, and on Tristan's point, um, you know, I like this idea of being authentic um, in everything that we're doing, um, on every, you know, post that we're sending out, but also ensuring like the respect of others and ourselves. And I think it just brings me back to this idea that if we cherish our own stories with dignity and integrity, um, and then if there ever comes a time when, you know, we are entrusted with another person's story, um, we will know, again, what it means to uphold the dignity and integrity of that person's story as if it were our own. 
Um, and also on Kath's point of um, being very intentional, I think that's really um, important um, about, you know, the language we use, the frameworks that we're using. Um, so I completely agree with that. And again, going back to relationship building and um, the time that it takes to, um, to create those relationships and make those relationships. So now um, I'd like to turn the floor back to Raghi. Um, we've heard the many ways that dignified storytelling is practiced in the international cooperation sector. Um, and we've also heard um, many themes of the sustainable development goals in terms of gender equality, the environment, maintaining you know, peace and stability, um, sustainability. Um, and again, this framework, these principles is one of many tools um, to improve practice. Um, so, Raghi, what does it mean to pledge to these principles um, as individuals and organizations? Thank you, Rukaya. Well, um, the pledge is not just a pledge to dignify storytelling as kind of a program or an initiative. It's actually um, the pledge we have created is to the 10 principles, you know, in a way to help um, guide storytellers around specific practices. Um, and again, like I said, you know, their full transparency, social responsibility and deep respect. And these are the kind of the three main pillars of the pledge. It's also because it's an advocacy tool, because it's symbolic and it's non-binding, it serves to us as kind of a constant reminder, you know, um, as a storyteller or as someone working with storytellers to always place human dignity at the heart of any story we tell. Um, you know, our motto has always been what stories are told and how they are told matters. And we continue to echo this uh, throughout. So I am like highly encourage and invite everyone to, to do take the Dignified Storytelling Pledge. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're very happy that almost 89 organizations have done that uh, and over 350 individuals. So we're, we're, we keep increasing our movement. And um, that's that's all. The second the second point that maybe okay, if I if I may also since you've touched on the SDGs and and the fact we have been since the beginning of Expo since the opening of October we have been plugging into all the different thematic weeks that ha we held at Expo including recently the Global Goals where we invited um, the UN uh, uh, DGC uh, Under Secretary Melissa Fleming who is a storyteller herself and she runs this podcast um, Awake at Night and uh, and we we linked the dignified storytelling principles to the SDGs so in a way what we're doing is trying to contribute towards that positive impact of implementing the SDGs because you cannot have SDGs without doing dignified storytelling. Um, you know, you cannot have um, partnerships without, you know, um, you know, placing human dignity at the core of those. And uh, same thing goes with everything. And um, if I may actually like, you know, that, that one of the one of the key things we're working on now and we're so excited about it is is linking the 10 principles to gender equality and women's empowerment which you know in the lead up to international women's day which is going to be a huge celebration and a special day at expo um you know we're we're launching like a whole new kind of um uh, storytelling movement if you can if, if i can say that uh, we're calling it uh, we the woman uh, you know, where we're bringing in kind of creatives and artists and singers and performers to kind of um, elevate or amplify our messages of the 10 principles through music and through art, um, because we, we figured that that's the way to inspire, you know, the, the, the normal visitor outside the scope of what we're working on. So, so taking the pledge is not just a personal thing, it's also you becoming kind of a champion and an advocate uh, towards, you know, uh, taking that into heart and through your work and everything. So we hope, we hope uh, to, to be able to accomplish that. And, 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 you know, beyond also Expo 2020, you know, we, we're looking to have beyond that to create these partnerships. So uh, highly invite everyone to, to do and to take that pledge. So thank you.
Thank you for the insight, Ravi. Um, it seems to me that this pledge is one step towards taking action and something that is accessible to us all. Um, it is understanding that each and every one of us, again, must do our part to uphold the dignity of our own stories um, and those of others um, by using these principles, but also the diverse tools and frameworks you know, that are always available to us, um, including referring back to the SDGs, um, which were created to ensure that we practice dignified and ethical storytelling always. Um, so my sincere thanks to all of the panelists for sharing your knowledge and experiences around dignified storytelling. Um, I'd now like to invite participants to ask any questions to any or all of our panelists um, using the Q&A box. I know that I see a few here um, and I'll ask panelists to please feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to answer a specific question. I can start off with something that's in the box here. Um, Okay, so first question, what steps do different organizations take to seek consent for using photos featuring partners you work with? So maybe Kath or Tina, if you can um, answer these. Sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> uh, what, steps, what steps do different organizations take uh, to, con to seek consent for using photos featuring partners you work with? Yeah, so maybe I'll jump in. Um, so again, I'll just talk from the lens from public engagement. I'm not a writer. We do have journalists and writers on staff, but from the public engagement lens, it's always contacting the country program office, so local, um, and working alongside them to identify who we talked about vulnerability before. So like who's comfortable in actually having their story told um, and then kind of going through those steps, but it's always a local context is what I'm trying to say is it's not a demand or a, you know, um, we need you to come to this town hall. It's, it's always a work of collaboration and partnership. So I'll, I'll just stop there and let somebody else jump in. And I think Kath, you touched upon this um, previously in what you were saying in terms of like using photos and getting that consent. Um, but this also leads to the second question, like what uh, says, what resources do you recommend to help organizations, you know, deepen their consent process or anything that you, any insight you might have around this idea of consent? Um, so I don't have specific resources to point to, but I do like in, in this, I think, um, Enterprise has a similar similar way of seeking consent to to as as to what Tina was um, describing. It's um, it can vary from context to context um, because we we do work with uh, counterpart organizations who are you know unique and in very different uh, um, settings um, around the world and with different political contexts. So. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of trust in our in like the trust that we've built with our with our counterparts um, that they um, that they have sought like the, you know when they are just taking somebody's photo or discussing a story with some uh, a participant um, they they know their local context best and so they know the types of questions to ask that, you know, they, they do it in the person's local language. Um, they, uh, they know how to, like, they know if it's, if um, questions of safety need to be brought up or, um, you know, so there's a lot of trust in our, in our counterparts to do that uh, consent seeking. Um, and yeah, it's just another another reason why trust and, and relationship building is so important. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, I see. An, oh, Ravi, yeah, do you have an idea? Can I just add on that and maybe just possibly and uh, maybe I'm a bit biased, I mean, in terms of like also advocating for the handbook, but, you know, in terms of kind of also consent, um, you know, I'm, gladly kind of refer you to actually that the consent is more than a paperwork principle where there is kind of um, several kind of tips around how to actually do that and how to ensure kind of contributors understand and agree on the purpose of story. So building up also of what my colleagues are saying, um, there is kind of, you know, there's a different, there's a process that we have placed there. And it might not be 
the perfect process, but kind of in a way uh, it can act as a tool, you know, starting off with identifying obviously who your contributor or your participant, um, you know, also getting verbal consent, which, you know, in a way could be more relaxed or an informal dialogue. Um, and then of course, you know, recorded consent. And then of course, following up to reaffirm that consent. And here it, it in, in, in a way where, you know, truly informed means that, you know, that, the contributor understands, you know, different kinds, you know, when you're talking about consent is like why the storyteller wants to film or photograph or, you know, interview or, you know, what is the purpose of this content gathering, you know, what is the resulting um, communication products and, and where is that going to go? Like which channels, which mediums are you using it on social media? Are you using it for publications? Are you sending this back to the donor? It's very important, you know, that within the consent, uh, framework and the process uh, that this is important and you know to, to be actually the one of the the most important parts and it's you know it's 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 personally for me is having the right to withdraw the consent for further use at any time you know like you you need to be able to inform them that they can withdraw this consent if they need to uh, so I just wanted to kind of add you know just a little bit on that when it comes to consent because it has been a very very important topic in a lot of in our consultations and it will continue to come up and again and again and right now we're working actually with um, uh, an organization to help us frame what this kind of a form of consent that can help storytellers that are working in the development context to be able to kind of download this or very easily in case you know because sometimes you might not have access to it so you take a photo in a, in a in a place and then you realize that you actually didn't get the consent so we're trying to see how we can develop this through maybe an app or something that you can download so 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 that could also be something um you know hopefully uh, be part of kind of the legacy of, of what dignified storytelling can be thanks Thank you, Raghi. Um, and just to know, we will be sharing uh, the resources that Raghi was mentioning in the chat um, in a few minutes. Um, we have another question here um, from a participant. What happens when a story does cause harm? How do you address the hurt and how do you stay accountable? There's silence in the echo chamber here on, on that one. Um, I don't have personal experience. So I can't speak to that, um, but I'm sure I was just gonna throw the mic over to Raggy and say, is there any case studies that you're aware of um, as far as like failure? So, you know, we, we show a lot of the successes, but has there been any failure um, within this construct that you are aware of that might help answer the question, putting you on the spot? <laughs> No, no, absolutely. Um, when we started this initiative, um, and my colleague Shermin, also from the White Cares, have always kind of said, we did not want to point out the negative or what is at fault out there. Like we did not want to, you know, tell people or call them out for being unethical or, you know, because it's not in our culture and it's not in our, um, you know, in our DNA within within the initiative. But we did want to kind of place good case studies. That are out there, and we're we're still looking for you know more and more case studies around you know the ten principles. So there has been a couple of practices that we have identified in our research phase, um, uh, and we and maybe I can actually refer you to uh, a very very interesting and good report by Ready Ready Eight, uh, where where they I'll, I'll try to find it and send it to you where they kind of change the perception around that and they've looked at it and they've gone out and they've then kind of highlighted uh, who is doing good ethical storytelling. And in a way, they're also pointing the finger at also the others who are not, uh, but you know, without actually saying it, so subtly saying it. So I don't have, you know, I have personal experiences, you know, within, you know, uh, that maybe I can share one, uh, but um, you know, working working in my past job, I was I was giving a training to a lot of film students, and they asked me, um, "Was there a time where you did a mistake? You know, like kind of like did something unethical when it comes to storytelling?" And I said, "Not particularly, but I did 
have a project funded by an institution, uh, a European institution, and I was working in Africa at that time. And um, I went in with completely not doing my homework. I went in, you know, with a, with the research uh, that I've done behind my desk, uh, from behind the laptop. Uh, even though we were speaking to the government, we, either though we were, you know, had the information there. When I went down on the ground, it was a completely different reality. And I was not able to kind of, you know, put in place, you know, the project because it was kind of replicated from another country. So, so that was a big mistake. And, and you know, we, I had to make a big case and extend my stay there for two weeks because I said, you know, we're not going to implement this project this way. We have to create a completely different mechanism. We need to talk to the communities. We need to bring everybody who understands, you know, the context and we need to reframe this project again, redistribute the funds. We cannot, you know, put this money into capacity building if the institution is not there. So, you know, we have to, you know, build everything again. So in a way I fixed it, uh, but the story that has been kind of, you know, around and and the back and forth with the donor was a very interesting conversation and i and i and i remember kind of you know thinking you know the donor just wants to see pictures and results they don't understand what the context is so it's our job as storytellers and development practitioners to make sure that we're telling the truth and make sure that we're doing this in full respect and and, and transparency and i did that i went in and i said this is where the money's coming from this is what we initially had Please tell me if I'm wrong, because if I am, let's scrap everything and let's start from scratch, because this is the way it is. And if the donor pushes back, then so be it. Let's close the project. Uh, but but at the end of the day, we need to make sure that everybody here is comfortable with what we do. I hope that answers the question. Amazing. Thank you. Um, and in terms of understanding the context of um, the people and who we work with and the communities um, that we work with. Um, there's a question here, actually, and I want to note that none of our panelists are um, speaking from a fundraising uh, role at the moment. Um, but this question is more directed. Um, well, I'll ask the question. So the person says, as a fundraiser, I'm often disconnected from the people whose stories I am telling and sometimes also from the staff and vendors who are collecting the stories that I'm telling. What can I do in the way I frame my requests for participant stories and photos to promote dignified collection of stories and substantial content to inform my storytelling? So maybe our, our panelists can answer in terms of um, being in your roles, being people who work on the grounds with communities, with people in the development sector, um, do you have any advice for this person? So I'll put my hand up. I get nervous when there's silence for too long. Um, it could just be me. Um, so what I wanted to say was around, um, I know the separation and the gap that they're trying to describe, and I, I've seen it kind of a little bit internally, um, but I think the element of, of, of sending it back, so, so at, at the worst case scenario is after you've written the story is getting permission to actually publish the story. And that's where I think the connection will be made, where if there's been a like a total misnomer of what you've identified. And I know there's elements missing, like doing your homework and, and things like that, but I'm trying to support this individual and in, in moving things forward um, is, is at least by all means, get the, the, the end all permission from um, the community member that you're writing about. And I think that would open up that conduit of everybody's talking about relationships and, and trust building. I think there's an element there that you would show empathy and authenticity in your dignified storytelling by actually just going back and offering a review of, of you know, making sure your biases are, are not there. And, and like, you're really representing in an empathetic and dignified way, the community members. So that's one element is getting the, like getting the final approval, if that's what you want to call it, or permission or consent to actually go to publication. 
I know that's at the end. Another way, if you're really gung ho and champion, is to build policy. Is to actually, you know, move the con conversation at a senior management level and um, it, to, to 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 use your influence as the person who's actually gathering these stories. That this is what you need, and this is the framework that you need to do it in, and then just you know build it and move it up the chain, kind of like a groundswell um, that way. So two ways of going about it: the past and then the more like just doing it the right way, which would be formulating an, uh, a formal policy. If I, if I can and add to that a little bit um, about um, uh, like, I think as a, as a fundraiser or, or a comms person, either or you can um, uh, kind of, um, uh, you can uh, help equip who the person who's taking photos um, or the person who, or the people who are collecting stories um, with, uh, with the, you know, the, the, all the information that they're going to need uh, to relay to the person whose story it is. So you want to give them an upfront list of all the ways you believe that this story could be used, um, the photos, uh, how the photos may be used, um, and uh, that kind of just that goes back to the informed consent. So you, but you want to make sure that you can you can equip that person so that they're informing the uh, consentee uh, properly. Um, you can also um, you can think about uh, co-creating an interview guide if if um, if uh, there's certain. Um, questions that you want to ask of, of a participant or a counterpart or a partner organization. Um, uh, but you also want to like, you, you don't necessarily know maybe your areas of, of ignorance. So you want to co-create that, that interview guide with somebody who knows the local context. Um, and then kind of together, you can make sure that you're being like culturally sensitive and asking relevant questions, but also um, you can you can make sure that you know your fundraising or your story um, your your blog is is getting the information it needs to to you know to be a good fundraising piece or to be a good uh, story and formative and like the uh, story <laughs> and so, so that's kind of like the upfront work that I think you could try. Thank you so much, Tina and Kath, for sharing those tips. Um, there's another question here. Um, someone is saying, I understand that doing this right takes time. Um, I think this is in terms of communicating a message. So you've mentioned Twitter, et cetera. Is the answer not to tweet res or respond to messages? Or is there a way to respond and or put out dignified messages in social media? So I'm actually kind of curious about this myself because um, now as individuals and as organizations, we all have access to social media. Um, is there a specific way that we can respond um, and ensure that our responses are dignified? Should I take that? Yeah, I feel like I spoke a lot, so that's why I'm trying to like, <laughs> but I think, I mean, I mean, I think, I think it's, it's the, this, the second absolutely keep pushing dignified storytelling messages as you can, uh, irrespective of whatever negative or, um, you know, challenges that you, that you see on social media today. You know, I mean, obviously storytelling as, as a tool, it's, it's one of the most powerful, uh, you know, communication uh, avenues. So, for for me, um, you know, it has always been you know the, the empathy checks. Um, you know, when we employ what we're calling, and, and here this is also a tool that we talk about in the handbook is like employing what we call empathy checks. And throughout the storytelling processes, whether it's online or offline, even when you're conducting it, uh, it's 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 thinking about whether you are comfortable sharing the story, and if this actually is. Um, a deprecation of yourself or someone close to you. You know, we have we have this um, 
internal kind of uh, lingo that we use. We, we, we call it the mother uh, check we, we internally in the team. And we say, you know, would you be able to say that about your mother? Or would you be able, you know, to say that? So, so do an empathy check, make sure that, you know, is this something of a reflection of you? And we, we had this uh, storyteller, we created this video and he, he gave this example around um, going to Africa and then uh, doing a video as a, as a, as a filmmaker and, and um, the, the, the lady, uh, went in and said, okay, wait a second, you're going to take a video. They went in, they cleaned the house, she cleaned herself, put on makeup, uh, you know, changed everything. And here's the filmmaker said, wait a second, you know, this changes the story. And, you know, and then when he did an empathy check, um, he realized that, you know, what if I was asked to do the same, if someone enters my home and says, you know, um, I want to take a video of you, what would, what would I do? I would, you know, obviously, you know, clean up, brush my hair, you know, brush my teeth, get a better look at the screen, just like all we did, like all of us did today, right? Like, I don't usually wear a suit at home. So, so, so it's, 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 it's that concept of empathy check. So use that for online as well, when you're tweeting, when you're talking, and don't ever hold back when specifically when you have like a message, you know, we, we, we have principles, you have code of conduct, there's ethical storytelling practices, and use those as your examples. And, you know, uh, a story can change the world. So, so do it, you know, one step as a chief movement has said in his performance, you know, let's change the world one dignified storytelling at a time. I also actually have a quick note um, on that question. Um, and by no means, I'm not an expert again. Um, but when I, I think it's helpful to look back to the principles and consider these principles. And when I think about social media and what we put out on social media, whether it be a caption or a message, um, the principle I do my homework really stands out to me, um, whether it be for, you know, Black History Month or International Women's Day or other human rights or social justice issues. I think it's really important that we do our homework. I know that we are all passionate storytellers. We all want to advocate and be activists and, and say something really Really meaningful and powerful, but just ensure that principle of, you know, I do my homework, looking into the social norms, the morals, the cultural norms, um, the language that we're using to, again, ensure the empowerment of people um, and the dignity of people as well. Okay, so, oh yeah, Tristan. Yeah, I just quickly wanted to add on just because everything has just been really Please. resonating uh, for myself. And so one of the things that really comes uh, for me is really, you know, going back to cultural protocol, um, because I think, you know, that's one thing that we tend to forget, especially when we are engaging with, you know, the BIPOC community and especially Indigenous communities in particular, um, just, you know, because I think, you know, just around the sensitivity about what the story is going to be told, but I think, you know, even coming to light that I'm beginning to see, so I'm currently um, getting involved with the tech and innovation sector, um, leading a in, leading community engagement. And so one of the key pillars that I'm experiencing for myself is that there hasn't been a lot of movement or representation for Indigenous people within the sector. And so it's more so what we're currently exploring is that indigeneity. But also going back to is that, you know, Indigenous sovereignty over data as well, because we are getting to see, you know, these virtual storytellers, you know, sharing uh, traditional uh, stories over TikTok now, you know, we're seeing that really amplify within a lot of our communities. And so, yeah, I think it, all, it does, uh, you know, go back to really, you know, being respectful and doing that acknowledgement piece in terms of the cultural protocols. Thank you, Tristan. Um, that was a very yeah, thoughtful answer. Um, and so we are surprisingly on time. Um, and so I want to quickly go around and invite our panelists to share any closing remarks, um, including maybe any key messages that you have around dignified storytelling that may inspire us to take action to, you know, advance global uh, sustainable development and international cooperation. Um, I also invite Chief Moomin, um, who was gracious enough to stay for our um, panel to share some words as well. And I guess I can start off with Tina. Maybe do you want to take the floor? 
sure that silence, but I didn't jump in because I thought there was an order that you were going to go to. So, um, so I just want to thank you. And I, I want to thank the dignified storytelling um, folks for elevating this conversation. I think um, it's sticky and it's, uh, there, there's some complexities, multidimensional, and we're not, we're not, it's not nearly finished yet. I think we're somewhere in the middle, but the conversations are being had um, within the volunteer cooperation uh, program sector, definitely. Um, we meet and talk about these different aspects um, every other week. I think we meet twice a week, but just thinking OCIC as well, I was looking at the panel, I was like, only OCIC can bring a group of people so diverse and representative together. And it's very um, healing, I think was the word that came top of mind when I was listening to Tristan and obviously Chief Momen and just the aspects of education and learning that were coming from Raggy and Kath. Like um, that's my message is, is, a, is a, a, a message of gratitude and humility um, and that uh, you've allowed me to look at my role in a new lens of privilege <laughs> and responsibility. And I just wanna end with a quote from, again, one of my favorites is uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. The single story creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. And so with that, um, thank you again. And uh, over to my, my next colleagues on the panel. I see Kath right next to Tina on my screen. So I'll hand it over to you, Kath. Alrighty. Um... I guess, uh, yeah, thank you so much to OCIC for providing this space. It's been um, really uh, wonderful to hear from, uh, you know, colleagues around the world and, and it, yeah, and, and having the opportunity to kind of um, self-reflect uh, is always important because, uh, story uh storytelling is is uh you know the way we tell stories and how we share them it's always evolving it's always something that you need to constantly keep yourself educated about um uh so that you can do it well and um you know the language we use evolves uh and the you know it's it's important to keep having conversations like this so that we can all um keep doing our absolute best and, and hold people's stories with care and uh, compassion and empathy. Uh, so thanks for having the space. And uh, uh, should I pick somebody? <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh, how about uh, Tristan? <laughs> yeah, just first off, I just have to really say much for this opportunity, even though I'm a young person still navigating you know, this journey within life. And, you know, just for myself, I always go back to, I've been seven years off, uh, off my community reserve, you know, that itself is pretty profound because one thing that's really key, a key takeaway for me is, you know, to be a trailblazer within a lot of these spaces, because there's not a lot of people within my own community that are working within non-Indigenous spaces, but also really to help amplify, um, you know, um, a lot of this work too. And so, you know, I just really have to, I'm just in awe with who I'm able to share this virtual space with, you know, I've been, it would have been way more awesome to be all in person, but I just have to say, you know, I really just want to reflect and just thank everybody who has been such an incredible teacher this morning, because that's the way I like to view everybody, you know, there's very, there's, a, you know, a strong learning that everybody, you know, has shared today and and I think it's just remarkable to even be here on an international level to share space from people that are calling in from different countries. Um, and yeah, I just have to say that, you know, for me, when it comes to storytelling, you know, it is continuous, it's never stopping and it's part, and that's the way I kind of look with, you know, even healing um, as well as that it is a continuous journey. And so I just have to say thank you again for allowing myself to share space with you all. Uh, because this is, has been a, a exceptional learning opportunity for myself. So miigwech, thank you. And I guess I'll pass it off to our final panelist, Ragi. Thank you. Um, well, 
I think allow me first to to say how how like it's been an honor to kind of you know also share you know the virtual stage with with all the panelists. I've, I've personally learned so much through this uh, experience and hearing your stories and hearing your vast experiences within the storytelling, um, you know, uh, field. I, if I continue, I think the work that we have done over the past you know, two years since we kickstarted Dignified Storytelling is only just the start. I feel like there's so much out there and every single day we're learning so much that there's, um, you know, uh, excessive amount of like, you know, best practices that we need to kind of, you know, do that. And we're, and we're very happy to try to create more of a platform to bring together storytellers and people to with working with storytellers and bridge kind of that gap. So I wanna first thank, of course, OCIC for, for this opportunity and for um, you know embodying dignified storytelling. It made us so happy within the team. You have no idea how, how you know, seeing you know, dignified storytelling everywhere, you know, uh, where two years ago, you know, it was just an idea. Uh, so, so seeing that come to life, through these conversations and thing is something. And if there's one thing that kind of I would leave you with is, is, is something that we uh, value a lot is that dignified storytelling empowers, you know, contributors, you know, it cultivates empathy and, and, and inspires action. And because it's such a powerful tool, it, it also looks for a kind of bright light in all people, um, you know, from a place of empathy or connection or partnership or respect. Um, and we can only do that if we're working together, you know, specifically with people and communities, as Tina has kind of, you know, told us, you know, and portraying them as capable of, of changing their own lives. So it's definitely not my story. And even when it is my story, I will continue saying it's not my story. <laughs> but, you know, I highly, um, you know, appreciate everything that, uh, uh, you know, I heard today. And I'm taking a lot of reflections as well. So thank you to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone, for your closing remarks. Um, and I'm also now happy that we've made a full circle here with Chief Moomin opening up our, with the keynote performance. And now we can maybe have some closing remarks from you as well. well thank you very much, Rukia. And um, it's been exciting just sitting back and listening to all the perspectives. Um, a great African novelist um, by name Chino Achibi writes in his seminal work, Things Fall Apart. And if I may paraphrase the proverb that when a a man, a person, invites his kinsmen to a feast, or to to to. to it doesn't he doesn't do so because each person cannot find food in their own house, but it's because it's important to meet and share kinship, and that when we also meet under the moonlight, it's not that each of us cannot see the moon in our own houses, but it's because it's important for us to meet. So the idea of kinship, the idea of coming together, I see that all of us here are doing things in different ways that go around the principle. So just having the discussions, listening to each other reinforces this work that we're doing and gives a lot of credence and momentum, you know, to the whole idea of dignified storytelling. And it's only in coordinating our effort, our energies and our passions that we can create, you know, that's, you know, that, that massive change that we want to see in the world. So I'm very excited to be here. I'm grateful to all the participants who joined in. And for me, one thing I'm taking away here is the value of reflection, you know, I don't know if it's Keith, uh, Keith who talked, Kat, sorry, who talked about, you know, pausing and just reflecting over the decisions that you make and the things that you do. So that's the one thing I'm taking that we should all pause. Sometimes we can be automated to work in a particular way because of the cultures that we are used to, but it's important for us to challenge our assumptions, you know, every time and see if we're really putting out the right messages and taking them through the right processes. So the value to pause and reflect and reevaluate our processes and you know inject new energy, new life, new ideas, I think is very welcome. And I thank you all for having me today. And to all of you, I, I look forward to great opportunities to interact. Thank you so much, Chief Moomin, and thank you, everyone. Um, I was so humbled to be able to moderate this panel of all of you experienced, experienced storytellers. Um, so thank you again, and I will now hand over the mic to Ileana. 
Thank you, Rakaya, and thank you all panelists for an amazing, amazing session. Today, we've been introduced to dignified storytelling as one of many frameworks and tools for good practice. We've learned about storytelling from the angle of public engagement, from communications, and so much more. And uh, we'd love to uh, continue this discussion tomorrow, where we will be learning more about the approach of Photographers Without Borders to ethics and storytelling. And we'll have the opportunity to put these principles into practice with peers in our lab. So along with the recording of this event, we will also share links to guidelines for ethical principles for public engagement practice and to the Global Hive website as additional tools for your reference, co-developed by many organizations across our sector in Canada. We are now going to launch a poll to gather your reflections, feedback and takeaways from this session. Please take two minutes to complete the poll that will show up on your screen right now. I see that we've received all of our responses. So I'd like to take this opportunity now to thank our contributors. Thank you, Shaylin. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Chief Moomin, Ragi, Kath, Tina, Tristan, and Rakaya for an incredible session. And truly, as everybody's saying in the comments, insightful as well as inspiring. I want to thank our colleagues at Global Affairs Canada for their interest, engagement, and financial support of this event and of the overall work of the Council. I would also like to thank our participants for your time and your interest. I hope that you've learned a lot about dignified storytelling and continue to pursue storytelling uh, efforts moving forward. Um, I'd like to thank the OCIC team for their support, planning for and hosting this event. And like I said before, we would love it if you could join OCIC and award-winning documentary photographer, director, storyteller, and founder and executive director of Photographers Without Borders, Danielle Khan de Silva, in tomorrow's Innovation Lab um, on ethical storytelling. Please find the registration link with a brief overview of Saturday's Innovation Lab in the chat. We encourage participants to critically reflect on the principles of dignified storytelling and to consider signing on to the pledge and to continue learning more about ethical frameworks and efforts, including in storytelling. Thank you again very, very much. I hope you all have a wonderful day.